Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I have structured today's meeting today around the impact of the current uh, COVID-19 state of emergency and its impact on uh, our schools. Next week, we'll have uh, time to discuss bills before us as well as any legislative action needed to help us through this pandemic, um, as well as prepare for the best we can for FY21. So we'll start today with the Secretary of Education, particularly now that the directive has been issued to close schools for the remainder of the school year. Um, we will also have an opportunity to hear from uh, the Joint Fiscal Office on uh, the state of the Ed Fund and some of the challenges there. We'll hear from the School Boards Association who can help us better understand governing and budgeting issues that they're facing uh, at this time. And this afternoon, I'm hoping that we'll be able to hear from Bisbet who will help us understand some of the issues related to managing risk uh, for our schools. Um, and then we're also lucky to have Aaron McGuire here who is from the Essex Westford District but is also president of the National Organization of Directors, uh, for Directors of Special Education. And I know that special education is a real concern that we have. Um, this afternoon, we'll hear a little bit more from the ground in terms of we'll hear from superintendents and teachers from an array of districts. And you know, I know a particular interest to all of us is going to be uh, related to the directives that were tended not to be in the wheelhouse of, of schools, such as child care, the meals, the new directives on continuity of education, certainly special education. And I think for all of us is the concern around equity, where in a time where equity is greatly challenged. Um, so uh, with that, I, um, I, I welcome the Secretary of Education and commend you on the, the, the work that you're doing and the complexity of the job um, in designing something that we have never had to do before. So welcome and thank you for being well, here. Good morning, it's uh, great to see you guys. Um, hope you're all doing well. Um, I guess I'll uh, make some general comments and then um, you know open it up to questions from the committee. The, uh, as the chair mentioned uh, last night, the governor uh, issued um, a new uh, update to his executive order. And um, it's basically three areas that are uh, the focus relative to the K-12 system. One, uh, as the chair mentioned, uh, schools uh, will now remain dismissed for in-person instruction for the remainder of the school year unless the governor uh, orders otherwise, uh, which, which could happen depending on how um, the virus uh, response is handled. The uh, schools uh, are now going to be required to implement continuity of learning plans uh, for remote learning, and we're drawing the distinction uh, between continuity of education and continuity of learning. Uh, the continuity of education is, is basically the disposition we were in originally when schools were dismissed, um, and now we're, we're going to turn the corner and actually try to move forward with uh, ensuring student learning uh, continues and academic achievement progress is made and so forth. Uh, so school districts um, will be required to create um, continuity of learning plans and have them ready to go by April 13th. Um, we'll be working, the agency will be working on a series of uh, guidance uh, so forth to define the parameters of this work. Uh, one of the issues that's identified in the governor's order specifically is the issue of uh, end of year gatherings and graduations. Um, and uh, in the order, uh, we're required to issue that guidance prior to May 8th. Uh, we'll certainly be uh, paying close attention to the trends in the virus and um, you know, be making some uh, recommendations based on the likelihood that school would continue to be closed throughout the, through the end of the school year. Um, but you know, certainly uh, addressing the issues of seniors and end of year gatherings will be a, a priority. Uh, there, there's a couple other things in the executive order that get into a uh, relative to childcare. Basically the childcare uh, issue as it pertains to K-12 is now uh, encouraged. Uh, it's not as strong as a recommendation or a requirement as it was previously. Um, and I think that acknowledges um, the prioritization that the K-12 system will now have on creating, designing, if you will, continuity of learning activities and uh, still um, engaged significantly in feeding children as well, but shifting our focus largely to that continuity of learning activity, which will be, which will be a tremendous undertaking. Uh, last night, um, I issued some uh, initial statement to superintendents and independent school heads um, 
hopefully the committee will, will I, don't, I don't know to what extent you have access to those emails, but um, I asked this morning for my staff to send that on to Avery. So maybe uh, you'll have access to that at some point, but basically just to um, in my email last night to superintendents and independent schools, uh, defining firstly what we mean by continuity of learning, meaning that it, uh, districts will be required to provide education services and related supports to all their students remotely. Uh, and that can mean a variety of issues. So certainly we'll be talking a lot about technology, uh, but there's other solutions that districts are employing. Um, but uh, shifting education uh, to a remote uh, process uh, so that academic progress is achieved as if schools had remained open. Um, and we're, as I mentioned, uh, the requirement is that districts make that transition between now and April 13. A lot of work has already gone in on the ground. Uh, in anticipation of that, we've been trying to signal uh, to districts uh, that, that this might be an eventuality. Um, I think it, um, you know, folks have started to work on that and uh, we'll be uh, producing some guidance on that very quickly. Um, hopefully we'll support that work and uh, not, not um, disrupt the work that's already been going on in the last couple of weeks. Um, and also in my email last night, I just signaled a couple of the more immediate guidance topics that we'll be addressing. Um, first and foremost, the issue of student attendance and calendar requirements and so forth, and that will help districts begin to structure um, how they're going to staff um, uh, providing continuity of learning. Certainly as a priority, a related priority is how we're going to support students with disabilities during this process. Um, and that's, that's going to be an area where we've already put out uh, some guidance on that. Uh, we'll get certainly more specific now that the uh, essentially the regular education environment will be redefined under this concept of continuity of learning. Um, second area we're going to, our third area we'll be putting a lot of focus on, as the chair mentioned, is equitable access. Um, particularly as we start to employ more technology. Um, our experience with technology that often shines a light on issues and I'm sure the it will immediately shine a light on equity issues across the state. Uh, so uh, this will be a focus of the work for school districts is how do we address those issues. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, we'll be addressing the issue of end of year gatherings and graduations. Um, and then specifically, and hopefully uh, by this afternoon, we're going to have guidance out on the format and submission parameters of uh, the school district continuity, continuity of learning plans. Uh, we're requiring districts uh, to implement them by the 13th, but we want to have them submitted to the agency um, by the 8th uh, so we can review them and provide some feedback. The, um, <clears throat> I think also there's a couple actions we're anticipating uh, because I think the, this is going to be significant work, new work, as the chair mentioned, uh, for a lot of us. I think there is some opportunity in this, but um, the priority is going to be, um, you know, taking care of our students as schools have always done, um, but it's going to be new. And there's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done to implement this and to plan for its implementation. So I suspect a, a significant role for the agency will be um, working intensively to support the collaboration that's really going to have to happen on a scale that we've never done before in Vermont, um, being collaboration across uh, schools, districts, across the state. Uh, to share resources and ideas on, on how to address student needs. The, um, so a big part of what we're, we're going to focus on is how to enable that uh, collaboration. Uh, one thing I'll be doing is establishing a task force of folks to help uh, assist in the design. Um, and I see this as a true community effort, if you will, the community being the entire state. Um, so we're hoping to engage not only K-12 higher ed parents, students, but also the business community and uh, to leverage community resources that might be available inside of Vermont and, and throughout the world to bring um, <clears throat> expanded learning opportunities to all of Vermont students during this time period. Um, we're looking significant, uh, serious effort is being uh, spent and uh, focused on uh, the possibility of deploying a statewide collaboration platform to do that. This is using technology and a learning management system. Uh, so we want to have some options for districts. Um, we'll find uh, districts have already or uh, some have learning management systems, other use uh, platforms like Google Classroom or so forth. So there's a lot of platforms out there. Um, we don't want to supplant or disrupt that work, but we also want to make sure we have some ability to share uh, practices uh, regardless of the system that might be emerging uh, that could be uh, deployed more uh, thoughtfully statewide. 
Um, so um, that's that's essentially uh, what we're working on today. I, I just to make a few comments regarding uh, other the context in our planning work. Um, <clears throat> I think you know a significant aspect of the COVID nineteen uh, response has been a communications response. So you notice that uh, we've we've had to ramp up significant communications uh, support to the field, um, and that includes liaisoning with a variety of other groups. Uh, within state government, uh, certainly working very closely with the Agency of Human Services, Department of Health, and so forth. We have been uh, right from the very beginning of this, um, <clears throat> but also on the national level as well, because, uh, you know, all states have been uh, struggling to respond to this and to diff different degrees. Um, I've been engaged uh, with biweekly uh, phone calls with the Council of Chief State School Officers, uh, my, my professional group. So they've also organized resources and so forth. Um, so we've had a direct conversation with other states and we're, we're kept apprised regularly of how other states are responding uh, to these uh, uh, challenges. Um, we also, our congressional delegation in Vermont has been exceedingly responsive. Uh, so we've been, uh, been able to give two-way feedback and hear from them about issues that are going on in Congress relative to funding um, and other policy waivers that we might need uh, to ensure that we have the adequate flexibility uh, to respond um, in Vermont. Um, so there's been some areas where there's been, we've been tremendously successful in that regard. I would say feeding students has been exceedingly successful, uh, both in terms of the programmatic support from the federal government, the waivers, but just boots on the ground in Vermont uh, as our schools have resp re responded exceedingly well uh, to, to make that an imperative. But you know, those is an example of an activity that's gone exceedingly well initially. Um, but we'll need continued logistical support, um, both financially and uh, to address issues as the likelihood that staff that are engaged in supporting those activities uh, become ill um, with the COVID-19. So, you know, we're, we're off to a good start in some areas and we've built out some really good communication structures, logistic support structures, but all those things uh, will be tested significantly um, as the blossoming of the virus uh, continues as expected through uh, the first part of May. So I think all in all, um, the system has responded exceedingly well. Uh, now we're going to um, put increased emphasis on con continuity of learning, which will be a, a whole new world. Uh, just reading uh, you know, Twitter feeds this morning, I think folks are, uh, as much as we anticipated this eventuality, it's still somewhat of a shock. Um, and folks are um, gonna, I'm confident they're gonna rise up and uh, do, do real, some really interesting work. But right now we're, we're gonna need a couple weeks to really start to articulate out what that, that means um, as we start to address uh, the equity gaps and so forth and make sure our most vulnerable students are uh, supported uh, through this process. Why don't I stop there and uh, be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, I have a couple and I know that um, Representative James has one. I, I wanted to just, start with, um, I think a, a lot of us are quite concerned about the mental health needs of children, um, particularly uh, given that we, the schools have access to the designated agencies. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, are you in contact with, um, with the Agency of Human Services around our, our children that, that have some significant mental health issues that are likely to be exacerbated under the current conditions? Yeah, we are certainly uh, in direct contact. I would just uh, also say that the, just the general anxiety that this um, this uh, virus has caused among children, and just the role of the regular classroom teacher uh, that often we sort of take for granted, perhaps, in uh, handling the the needs of students emotionally and from a mental health perspective. So. A better part of um, we have to be very cognizant of as we try to do remote learning is just to acknowledge that the role of teachers uh, play in the lives of students in terms of providing that stability in their daily lives. And uh, as you know, in some families, that's more significant of a role than others. Uh, so it's a very important aspect of just the underlying supports for students. We need to ensure that teachers can maintain regular contact with students. Um, and uh, certainly to coordinate with other mental health agencies, but a, a significant challenge for us is just how to maintain that regular contact with parents as students, or excuse me, with teachers that students find so reassuring and the stability of the school routines um, that also uh, bring them some assurance. So it's gonna be a big part of our challenge, I think, in the work before us. We'll be hearing from the superintendents on that as well. Um, Representative James, you had a question. Can 
hear me? You, there. Start Great. now. Start again. Thanks. Secretary French, I, thanks so much for being here. I, I realize it's uh, probably too early to talk about this. Um, as the schools you know, have still a couple more weeks to get their, their plans submitted. But one of the things I've been concerned about, um, and I know uh, I'm hearing this from some of my constituents, are families um, accessing remote education when they don't have high-speed internet or any internet at their home. And I just wonder if you have a sense of what kind of options or um, alternatives schools could offer to families that were relying on schools and libraries and other public places to connect. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it's good to see you. Uh, the, um, yeah, I think, you know, certainly we're going to be uh, using technology significantly uh, in the concept of remote learning. Um, and that's, that's appropriate, I think. And, uh, but it varies greatly. And once again, technology will, will shine a light on uh, many of the equity issues we've known that have always been there. It just makes it more visible to us. So I think the, the concept of remote learning is, uh, is going to be more broadly defined beyond technology as well. Uh, we've already seen examples where schools have been used as hubs to distribute materials and so forth for students, uh, you know, pick up sort of like takeout at restaurants. You know, we have schools that are having students or parents of students drive up and grab things, stuff like that. So we'll be pursuing all kinds of options. Um, I think, you know, the Department of Public Service has done an inventory of Wi-Fi hotspots and so forth. So we are going to aggressively do what we can to ensure students have the technology access. And I know uh, some districts who previously were not, uh, did not have Chromebooks, for instance, or laptops deeply deployed have made you know, accelerated efforts to do that. Um, but I think, you know, we'll see a variety of things. I'm particularly uh, concerned or interested in uh, the K through five approach in remote learning. I think, uh, High school, you know, we have a better conceptualization, particularly with technology of how to deliver high school um, online. You know, high schools are largely structured around a course as a basic paradigm for education. We don't use courses generally K through five. You know, we use classes. Um, you know, it's not, um, it's pretty typical at the lower elementary to have one teacher teach a variety of subjects, if you will, or it's a much more integrated approach. So how that ends up being deployed as a remote learning concept when uh, such a priority is placed on the socialization of students with their teacher uh, is gonna be a, a challenge for us, uh, particularly in Vermont where we have uh, approximately a third of our schools are less than 100 students and many of them are very small elementary schools. Uh, so uh, remote learning as it pertains to elementary will be a significant challenge. And uh, I think also we'll see some really interesting uh, and creative responses in that regard. And um, it's my hope that, you know, Vermont will really help redefine what, what that might look like in a 21st century way. Um, but we have a variety of things beyond technology uh, available to us. So we'll have to, we'll, everything's on the table basically in terms of deploying creative solutions in that regard. Do you anticipate, um, and then, then I'm done, do you anticipate that many schools would need to scramble to try to purchase and distribute Chromebooks to families? Uh, we've seen districts doing that already, um, you know, buying large numbers of laptops and so forth, but um, I'm not sure to, to the extent that'll, um, you know, how widespread that will be on a state level, but, uh, you know, we have, we have, in spite of what we uh, think in terms of uh, internet access, there is quite a bit of internet access around for schools, um, but there are certainly pockets where it's just, there is none. As you know, there's no cell coverage in some spots as well. So um, it is, it's gonna be a challenge for districts who, on a, from an equity standpoint, who are gonna rely significantly on technology. They're gonna have to figure out a way to uh, provide a non-technology solution for those, those parents and students that um, don't have access. Thank you. Others? There, um, let's see, we have Larry first and then Peter. Can't hear you, Larry. Oops. There we go. Can yeah. hear me now? Yep. So, um, Dan, a little concerned. How are, how are the many, many teachers and students um, that we deal with on a daily basis, um, how are the teachers reporting should they become um, sick with this COVID-19? Are they reporting directly to their superintendents or to the agency? Um, in context, some teachers are going house to house, um, leaving uh, studies and so on to the children. 
Is there a way that they're reporting this should they become ill? Yeah, I mean, so teachers are, uh, you know, subject like all of our monitors to the same health guidance uh, that, um, you know, all of us should follow. So, you know, there are districts we've seen in a couple cases as teachers have become ill um, because teachers, you know, generally play a significant role in their communities, um, you know, due to the web of connections they have with students and so forth. Um, the knowledge of a teacher uh, being diagnosed or confirmed with COVID-19 uh, tends to have uh, ripple effects through the community and uh, cause for concern and so forth. So it, uh, on the one hand, uh, it's treated just like any other uh, uh, confirmed case, you know, where, you know, people basically quarantine themselves or follow those guidelines from the CDC or Department of Health. And then if they have more severe symptoms, they see their um, health provider. Um, we have, you know, the issue of communication often with when a teacher becomes confirmed and so forth, where uh, they work, you know, closely with their supervisor, in most cases, the principal, and then ultimately the superintendent. Uh, teachers, like all Vermonters, have a right to privacy in terms of their uh, protected health information, so standards like uh, come into play as well. Um, but I think increasingly, uh, as, as the virus spreads, we'll see more, more confirmed cases and uh, as a society, we'll become more comfortable with that as a reality. I think the related issue on continuity of learning will be how do we support the con continuity of learning when the teacher becomes ill, you know, in the, in the regular <laughs> school setting, that would mean a substitute teacher and so forth. So the issue of lesson plans, how, how um, content can be deployed is one thing, but you know, that issue again of uh, how important the day-to-day -day social interaction between teachers and students can be. Um, so when teachers are ill, you know, what's that impact on remote learning? It could be significant from an emotional standpoint on students. So, but the issue of, of teachers going around, um, you know, the, the teachers should be following the social distancing guidelines. And uh, I think we have really well-established protocols uh, from the Department of Health on that. So. Um, and we've put out some guidance on that and we'll put out more guidance as necessary to um, just reaffirm the, you know, the priority one right now and the reason that schools have been dismissed is to, to address the, um, the spread of the virus, to slow it down at this point, you know, so um, that's, that's got to be on the forefront of everyone's thinking right now and uh, we need to protect the viability of our healthcare system at this critical moment in the spread of the virus. So. Uh, we're going to work hard to do the continuity of learning, but <clears throat> we have we have to really be disciplined as a society to understand the importance of this particular next four weeks or so that we're going to go through. Thank we're you. Gonna, we're going to be hearing from the field this afternoon, and I imagine after we talk with them, um, we're probably going to want to have another another chat with you next week, um, particularly around just just the concern of of. of continuity of education, continuity of learning in relation to the, the inequities that, that are, are very obvious to, to all of us. Um, and I'm just, we'll, we'll discuss that later. I know Peter, you wanted to, you had a question. <clears throat> uh, yeah, you know, a lot of where, where, where we sort of stopped doing our business was assuming business as usual, business as usual is out the window. Um, so, Dan, I, just, I wanted to ask a couple of questions about sort of our work and our logistics. You know, we've got some legislation that we've been working on. There's legislation that the Senate has been working on. Uh, is there anything there that you would like to see continue um, in particular? And I also had a question about various deadlines that are set in law. And I'm thinking specifically about Act 173, if we need to be doing some adjustments there in order to uh, face the new reality. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, we, we are turning some energy on that. You'll, um, as we, I think I telegraphed at the beginning of this crisis, you'll be uh, probably not seeing uh, Ted a lot. Uh, it's great Ted's on the call this morning, but Emily Simmons, our general counsel will sort of be our liaison to you in that regard. Uh, I am meeting with Emily this afternoon uh, to start reviewing uh, that work and making sure uh, the I's get dotted and T's and so forth get crossed. Um, I think obviously, you know, work on 173, uh, the timelines and so forth will all need to be adjusted uh, again. Uh, we were prepared to, uh, you know, we were working on uh, bringing uh, a coherent um, and consensus uh, recommendation to you as a committee prior to the outbreak of um, 
COVID-19, when I say coherent and consensus, I mean among all the various stakeholders this year, we were going to try to, you know, bring that forward together. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be making sure those things, anything you need from us at Emily will be your contact and we'll be ready to support you in your work in that regard. Um, but certainly the priority right now has been on COVID-19. Um, I think a big chunk of the work will be financial that we'll be uh, working very closely with the General Assembly on as we get into the issues of the Ed Fund and uh, cost liabilities and so forth. And uh, what we're seeing so far from uh, the federal government is we're um, seeing, uh, I think, a real lot of support, both um, from the financial end and also the flexibility. And I think the two go hand in hand. Uh, we don't know yet what this is going to cost. Um, but we do know that it's going to require us to have some flexibility to address uh, the conditions on the local ground uh, in terms of student education and support the school districts and so forth. So, so far, I'm very optimistic that um, what I've seen coming out of Congress seems to indicate that we'll have adequate flexibility. Um, and that's a critical, real critical component. But um, yeah, Emily will be our liaison to you and your work, and uh, we'll we'll make sure that those priorities are are surfaced pretty quickly for you. And we'll have yeah. an opportunity to talk about that quite a bit uh, next week. And I will uh, check in with Emily. I I uh, do know that we have two um, bills in our committee right now, two miscellaneous ed bills that are um, vehicles for that. I know that there's 173 language in there. And we can look to see what we can we can move what we need to really move through quickly. And what we thank don't. you. Great. Okay, Mr. Secretary, I thank you. We will definitely want to be hearing from you again. Um, hey, I I just wanted to mention two other representatives had questions. Sorry oh, to sorry. interrupt. I see that now. Yes, Sarita. Sorry. Yes, Sarita, you had a question. You're on mute. Can you unmute, Sarita? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you can hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I want to just go back to what Kate was talking about, about the concerns about the mental health of the children. And I think, um, you know, we're all aware of the impact of emotions have on learning, you know, especially anxiety. I'm wondering if there's going to be something built into the program every day, you know, either by a phys ed teacher or something that kids could do either in their living room or something that's safe, but where they're physically active, you know, every day for, you know, half an hour or 40 minutes in order to help them lessen their anxiety. Yeah, I agree. That's, a, that's an important uh, aspect to consider. And I think uh, we'll see those patterns. They've already emerged from teachers just uh, as they've been building out their initial uh, thinking around continuity of education and the sort of initial phase just to maintain things. We've seen acknowledgement of the importance of physical activity uh, emerge already, but certainly I would consider that a best practice. Thank you. Dylan, you had a question? Yeah, greetings. Uh, and thank you, Secretary French, for coming and joining us in this new format. We're in a new world. Um, I am just wondering about uh, now that we're entering this phase of continuity of learning, uh, just as we move forward, um, I'm wondering about AOE capacity. We know that even in normal times, uh, we've had concerns about capacity on the committee. Um, and specifically, I'm just wondering about the speed with which guidance is getting to the field. I have seen incredible and heard incredible stories about in terms of the initial phase of continuity of education and standing up systems. Our districts have moved very quickly to stand up things that we never thought were possible, really. I mean, we're talking about food for all our kids. We're talking about services of shifting to online education. Does the agency have what it needs? Because I just wanna make sure the field is getting directives uh, in a very timely fashion, recognizing you're doing everything you can, recognizing you're in crisis. To me, the moment we're in requires really clear guidance that is timely. And I was just concerned because I heard some rumblings last night that maybe the guidance didn't get to superintendents until after the news landed in the press that schools were going to be closing for the remainder of the school year. 
And to me, if you need support, uh, we really, you know, we need to know it. I don't know what we can do about it, but I just want to make sure at this point that we're having an honest conversation about what you need uh, so that the field gets what they need. Thank you. Yeah, I think right now we're doing fine in terms of that. I think, you know, uh, we'll certainly, COVID-19 will have a significant impact on the structure of the agency itself. Um, we uh, have a division, for example, uh, the divisions in the agency are comprised of essentially 25 to 30 employees. Uh, a division that was organized around pathways, which is Act 77, CTE, and so forth, will be leading uh, the work on continuity of learning. So just the aspect of giving them that charge and housing that, uh, that activity inside of that division will fundamentally transform that division. So it's, it's, it's premature, I think, to see you know, what, what shape that work will take relative to staffing at the agency. But right now, I think we have, we have the ability to do that. I think uh, an area where I've identified previously, um, you know, to the General Assembly in terms of need uh, over time will be the back office sort of functions of the agency where uh, those have never received a lot of attention, so to speak. And I think as we've, we've gotten into the like the SSTDMS initiative, the centralization of the business functions and so forth. Uh, you know, the agency is increasingly going to need capacity to manage the financial uh, aspects of the system and to provide oversight. Um, as you can imagine, the financial implications of this crisis are significant. And uh, I suspect we'll be uh, dealing with the financial implications for, for many years. And um, we're, we're no doubt going to have to keep an eye on that, um, you know, as federal resources are uh, being uh, targeted for support of COVID-19. Some of those resources are being targeted for SEA or agency uh, capacity. Uh, so we'll be leveraging those uh, to support districts as best we, best we can. Um, but, you know, back to the communications piece, I think, you know, we've been in some cases sometimes uh, producing guidance too quickly. Um, but it's, uh, we've largely been in a phase of needing to respond to emergency, emergency situation. And the guidance has largely fallen into that category of sort of the need to put out emergency uh, directives. And I've been uh, holding uh, direct uh, weekly calls with the superintendents to sort of have an opportunity to discuss with them beyond what the formal guidance says uh, more informally. Um, but I think as we turn the corner into continuity of learning, we're anticipating ramping up other structures with inside the agency to support that, uh, particularly the collaboration piece that I identified earlier. Um, our, our structure, communication structure as it is right now will be challenged somewhat uh, by what I anticipate the communications needs to support the field in this way. So we're actively uh, looking at infrastructure issues, meaning I've, I think I talked earlier about um, a customer relations management platform or a CRM, which many states have gone to, gets us out of email and off the phone uh, because we just, we have dynamic uh, communications demands that need to be managed across teams. And our teams are now working from their homes in a distributed way. So uh, we need to have that infrastructure in place that allows us to manage uh, the, the responsiveness that will be necessary to the field. So we are, we are actively exploring expanding that um, capacity. I am aware that uh, Ways and Means is going to be looking for Mark fairly soon. So um, I think what I'd like to do is, is shift and thank the secretary so much for your time and your work. Um, great idea about using your personalized learning folks, um, a lot of expertise in that department. Um, Good to see you all, take care. Yeah, thank you. So Mark, how's yes, the front? <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, earlier today, I think Chloe sent over to Avery a couple documents. Um, I don't know if you've got access to them, but um, if you do, I'd like to start with um, an education fund outlook. I think given the time we have, I can sort of get you up to speed on where we are in terms of the current year and then just talk a little bit about the issues that Ways and Means is having to address in terms of setting the uh, property tax rate parameters next year. Is, is this the one dated 324-20? Yes, it just says uh, possible COVID-19 revenue impacts 324-20. Yeah. yeah. Everybody looking at it? I've got it up front on Ways and Means <laughs> site at the moment, if, okay. if it's not on ours yet. Okay, so should I go ahead? 
I'm going to pull it up on our, our on my screen too. Here okay. we go. Thank you. You're going to send it, Avery, or should we find it on Ways and Means? Oh, I see. Thanks. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to start. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but because I, I can explain what's going on, I think, pretty concisely. But if you take a look at the middle column, which is labeled FY 2020 January forecast, that was what we were looking at um, for FY 2020 about a month ago, the beginning of this month. Um, and again, just, just to you know, keep everything clear, 2020 is the year we're currently in. So if you look down at the bottom of the sheet, if you go all the way down to line 31, you can see that at the close of 2020, we were expecting to end the year with a full um, stabilization reserve. On line 27, you can see a $26.4 million stabilization reserve. That is a full 5% reserve. Um, and in, in addition to that, if you drop down to line 31, you can see that we have a $12.9 million surplus. So that's what we were anticipating we were going to be looking at at the end of the current fiscal year. That was before any adjustments to revenues for the COVID-19 um, outbreak. So now if you go back up to the top of the sheet, um, on the right-hand most column, you can see that um, we've added one new line in there, which is line nine, and it's COVID-19 revenue downgrades. We don't have a really um, tight estimate um, for what revenue downgrades are looking like for um, FY20. So there's a range there of 35 to 45 million. That loss is entirely due um, to sales and use tax revenues, purchase and use tax revenues, and meals and rooms tax revenues. The reason for that is, you know, as we enter into a, a downturn when people lose their jobs or have business losses, um, consumers cut back, people aren't spending money, um, and so those consumption taxes are going to drop. And again, the estimate right now is 35 to 45 million. So if you look on the sheet in the right-hand column on that line nine, you can see there we've uh, subtracted from revenues $40 million, which is the midpoint of this estimate. So rather than having that 1.7 billion coming in, we're anticipating that 1.67 billion coming in. So now if you can drop back down to the bottom line again, you can see the impact of this. Um, we've assumed that expenditures have not changed, but now on line 22, you can see instead of having a, an annual operating deficit of about 16 million, now it's about 56 million. What that does, if you drop down below, as you can see on line 31, where we had been anticipating a $12.9 million surplus to carry forward into 21, we now have nothing. And if you jump up to line 27, you can see that instead of having a $36.4 million stabilization reserve to carry into FY21, we're now anticipating uh, our stabilization reserve of about $9.3 million. That's only about 1.3% of the target and it could be you know, $5 million worse, $5 million better based on the range of estimates we have, but um, we will still be heading into FY21 with basically you know, most of the cupboard bare. So I'll stop there for a minute um, in case you have any questions. And then uh, I'm not gonna have a lot of time to get into the revenue, uh, the issue brief, but uh, you might not want me to anyways, but I can hit a couple of high points and also um, talk a little bit about some additional information we've gotten yesterday in terms of the uh, federal stimulus package and the aid that's included in there for schools. So that would be great. And I know that I really would recommend that committee members do take a look at that uh, draft issue brief that's on maybe uh, Avery, you can pull that onto our website as well. Um, because you have some really important points in there that that have an impact on the work that we do. So, yeah, and I'm, I, I, wanted, I, want, I want to warn people, it's a pretty dense document. I'm going to try to um, draft up something that's a little bit more accessible to people that don't live in this world. But um, th th there, is, there is a lot of information in there. So why don't you give us some highlights? And, and also, if you have anything on, on the federal uh, stimulus. Okay, plan. so um, in, in, in terms of 2020, just briefly, um, you know, the revenue issue is primarily the... Um, consumption taxes, the non-property tax revenues that come into the fund, which are about a third of the total. Uh, if there's not an education property tax issue, we don't think in 2020, because most of the money from, from the education property tax that is due for FY 2020 is already in the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can see in the report, if you um, flip through later, we still think there's about $125 million outstanding. And there's a number of districts, um, I think uh, about 62 that still have half 
fully half of their education and property tax revenue still outstanding. So while the $125 million is not a big deal for the, for the education fund outlook itself, because you know, even a 1% um, failure to pay or failure to collect in that area would be about 1.25 million. So it's, it's not huge, but a little concerned about the 62 towns that still have half of the education property tax liability um, to be collected this year. Those districts may have some, some issues, some shortfalls that they have to address. Um, in terms of the um, just the, non the non-property tax revenues, um, you know, I don't have a lot to add there other than the 35 to 45 million. We're hoping to get a better estimate soon. That represents about two to 2.6 million percent of the ed education fund. So it, it's significant in that year. Um, but one other point, and I'll move on from this then, is that in addition to the money that we're, we're anticipating we're not going to get, the administration is going to allow businesses who collect these taxes, their trustee taxes, businesses collect them from consumers and remit them to the states. They're going to allow businesses to defer payments in um, March and April and make three payments on May 25th. Um, the, the only concern there, assuming that we ultimately collect all the money that's due, is that it could create a cash flow problem in the education fund because the last payment to school districts, which includes one third of the education payment, one third of all the categorical aid, big number. It's basically one third of that 1.71 um, million billion that we were anticipating goes out to districts on April 30th. So we wouldn't be getting in these additional receipts from uh, businesses on these taxes until after that's due. Um, in terms of federal aid, um, the only good news I have for you for 2020 is that uh, we've been looking at the federal stimulus um, aid package. And within that package, um, there's $13.5 billion in formula grants to states. States are allowed to distribute 90% 90, 90 of that money um, directly to school districts and retain 10% of it um, for emergency needs. Now, I've been trying to figure out exactly what Vermont's share of that $13.5 billion is, and my back of the envelope calculation indicates that it's going to be about $30 million. So that could go a long way towards um, closing this gap that's opened up in 2020. However, um, like um, the era money that we got from the feds back in the Great Recession, the money is going to go to the Agency of Education and then directly to school districts, and it'll bypass the education fund. We got around that back in, I think, 2010 and 2011 by reducing the general fund transfer by the amount of the um, federal aid. So districts remained whole and the education fund um, problem was dealt with. Uh, we no longer have a general fund transfer to the education fund. We have dedicated taxes. So that's an issue we're going to have to work through. Um, so that's basically it for 2020. Um, if there's any questions, I, it's probably a good time to jump in and then I'll just, you know, briefly go over what we're looking at for FY21. So. Questions? Okay, then. Um, so FY21, um, at this point, we're pretty much- Dylan, I'm sorry, Dylan, did you have a question? Yeah, I do have one, Mark. Um, there's been a lot of interest and uh, community activity around um, abating perhaps meals and rooms tax for those periods, those collection times, maybe it's going to be through April 25th or maybe May 25th. I just know there's a lot of activism there. Do we have a, an accurate estimate on how much abating, um, not just the penalty and interest that's been waived by the authority of the tax commissioner, but actually abating the tax amount for those businesses during that time frame would be? Yeah, um, I my last conversations with the administration indicated that they were not planning to abate any of it that all of the tax would become due um, on May, I think May 25th. And what they're being forgiven interest in penalties. So if they don't pay it, you know, they're encouraging businesses that can to go ahead and pay right along. And, and if that happens, then this is not such a concern, big a concern. Um, and they are gonna follow up with businesses if they, if they think that their business is not remitting the money that, and, they, and they're able to. Um, the, only other, the, the only wrinkle there in terms of lost revenue is that if a district's unable to make these first two payments, when we get to May 25th, there's an open question as to whether or not they're going to make, be able to make those three payments all at once into the education fund. And if they can't, then that 35 to $45 million gap is going to grow as a result of that. There's also a question of the abatement of um, education property taxes. And under current law, 
um, because we have a very decentralized system and we give responsibility for raising those revenues to municipalities, even though it's a state tax, they have the ability only to abate the municipal property tax, yep. not the education tax. So they get a sort of a double whammy if they don't collect money. On the one hand, they're going to be short of municipal property tax revenue. And on the other hand, they're going to have to remit to the state the education property tax that they owe, whether they've collected it or not. Now, you know, the commissioner can, there's an 8% penalty for late payments to the state as well. The commissioner, I think, has the authority to waive the penalty, but he does not have the ability to waive the authority for them to, you know, waive their requirement to pay that money into the education fund. So, did that answer your question? Yes. Yes, I, I actually just have one final question, and this, this is probably too early to say, but we eliminated the general fund transfer. We have dedicated revenue sources now into the ed fund. Mm -hmm. uh, just real quick, back of the envelope, do you think we'll be better off through this crisis or worse off for that decision? I know it's hard to say because we've had robust revenue growth from those sources yeah. in recent years. Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. We haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Um, we, we were starting to look at it um, in terms of what we were looking at at the beginning of the month, the middle column, 2020. But we haven't gone ahead and looked at it for what we're looking at right now, but it, it, it's, we. <laughs> when I come up for air, we can, we'll find out, but um, I'm not sure. <laughs> So Mark, um, let's make, maybe make this the, the last question because I know that you have to go. And it has to do with our, the towns that have not yet passed a budget. And we have several districts that have not yet passed a budget, which if they don't get uh, a budget in place by June 30th, uh, my understanding is that, uh, and I'm, look, I'm looking at the statute, I think you told me that they may borrow up to 87%. Yes. And the word is borrow. Who are they borrowing from? Uh, they would they would they would go out and borrow like they do now for short term borrowing. So it's whoever whatever bank they can go to. They wouldn't be borrowing from the education fund. It would come. It would be from their own um, re reaching out to to banks to make loans. Okay, that sounds easy. <laughs> the other the other thing that would happen, I found out since then, is that uh, the commissioner does have the authority to uh, impose the base tax rate on them for the homestead tax, which is a dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, without any adjustment for spending because they won't have a, a bill passed yet. Um, so those two things will be taken care of. But um, there are, um, it's a question now as to whether, you know, there were a number of votes that failed and there were a number of towns that haven't voted at all yet. They normally vote later. The question now is when, when are those votes going to take place? Um, South Burlington, I know, um, had a failed budget and they also had a revote schedule, which they have now postponed indefinitely, I think. Um, so there's those questions, but th that's the kind of stuff that um, Ways and Means is having to wrestle with this morning right. in terms of trying to set the yields, you know, the property tax parameters for next year. There's a whole range um, of issues. And, you know, I can, I know I'm running out of time here, but I can come back and talk to you about FY21 because the real problem in FY21 right now is that we have no idea what the revenue impact is going to be um, in 21. Uh, it's probably going to be bad in terms of the non property tax revenues. But it also may be an issue with collecting the education property tax revenues. Um, people who are, have lost their jobs, have significant business losses. It's a question of whether or not they're going to be able to pay those taxes in a timely manner. And uh, so that, that's, it, it's, it's really going to be tricky trying to figure out where the yield ought to be set. There's a default in law. There's been some discussion about using the December 1 yields because those are what school boards had in mind when they were it's, you know, creating their budgets and what they submitted to voters. So um, those tax, those tax rates wouldn't, the tax rates that result from the yields that were set or recommended on December 1 may be a way that we could go this year as well. That doesn't address the bottom line of the Ed Fund, but we, we don't really know where we are in 21 right now. There's also just the incredible complexity of uh, the collection of um, Ed taxes, given that it's, the dates are all set by the municipalities. Are there, are there is there a conversation at this point about trying to standardize that? Standardize um, yeah. these dates? I, I don't know how we could do it at this point, but you, you're right. You know, we have, we, we have uh, 259 towns. They all have different billing practices, different number of um, installments, different due dates. Um, but we were able to actually, Chloe did a lot of work on this and was able to um, figure out how much we have outstanding right now. Um, going into next year, I know Buell's Gore is the only um, tax collecting entity that I know that has already moved their collection dates um, to try to you know, address some of the um, immediate needs people have and push the taxes back a little bit, but um, that's all I've heard. So, 
and I, but I do, I do think municipalities may have the authority to move those dates. Um, Sue may have a better answer than that for me. We'll, and we'll be in touch with our, our sister committee over there in the Ways and Means, um, just to follow up on that. It's a complex problem here. Okay, um, need to let you go. And we have okay. um, Sue, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, okay. And then we have Sue and Aaron. And how, how would you like to do this? Aaron, do you wanna speak with us? I, I, First, I I'm fine you... if Sue goes first. I'd be interested to hear what she says and happy to follow up um, after her if, if you'd like. I think that's the way we were situated on your schedule. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Sue, and welcome. Thank and you welcome. so much. And it, <laughs> it's great to see all of you. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. I hope everyone's doing well. I hope your families are well. And um, just going to take the opportunity to give you a brief update. I know you have a lot of people you want to hear from today. First, I'll just uh, speak really briefly about what's been happening in the past few weeks and then move on to um, future concerns. So as you know, for the past few weeks, Vermont's education community has been sharply focused on the urgent issues that have been posed by this pandemic. It's really been an all hands on deck situation involving very long hours and new issues arising by the hour. The three main areas that have been addressed um, by the education community during this time were the provision of meals to students, child care for essential employees, and moving to new ways of providing education and planning um, for the continuity of learning and um, provision of services. The logistics, of course, involved in all each of these areas are very significant, and um, we can't thank our education community enough for their dedication to the health, safety, and the well-being of uh, students in Vermont. Everybody is really doing their part with a can-do attitude. With the governor's announcement last night that schools are dismissed for in-person instruction through the end of the school year, and that schools are required to have continuity of instruction, um, sorry, a continuity of learning plans for remote learning implemented by April 13th. We are entering new territory with many challenges ahead. Vermont's education community will need clear guidance from the Agency of Education as we continue to support students during this crisis. We all know, um, of course, that remote learning cannot replace a student's experience in school um, communities that when they're with their teachers, administrators, support staff, and other students. However, um, because we're in this unprecedented situation, it's important that we all pull together, parents and caregivers, students, educators, staff, administrators, school boards, and the agency of education to help students continue their learning through the end of this school year. Uh, the VSBA thanks Secretary French for the leadership and guidance he has provided during this difficult and challenging time. And we know that there's a lot more to be done. Clear guidance is going to be critical moving forward to support districts in their implementation of remote learning, including specific recommendations related to students with special needs and disabilities, English learners, and early learners. VSBA and other education associations are meeting with Secretary French and his team on Monday in order to offer our assistance with this work um, in order to provide support to the field with a unified message. In addition, I wanted to let you know what VSBA is doing to support school boards in their role in responding to COVID-19 uh, in a way that allows school district leadership teams to provide a unified message to students, parents, employees, and the general public. Um, the superintendents are the chief executive officers of the district with the responsibility to make many of the decisions during the initial period of this crisis. Moving forward, school boards have a vital role to play in staying connected with their communities. We know they have to do that remotely and working with their superintendents to provide calm and positive leadership. To support school boards in that role, VSBA is providing them with daily updates addressing questions they have on governance matters. Some of the things that we've covered um, in our daily updates so far are open meeting law questions, uh, budget vote questions from districts who have not held a vote yet and from districts whose budgets um, did not pass the first time they voted on them, 
postponement of annual meeting questions from districts who have not held their annual meeting yet, absentee ballot questions, questions about how the governor's executive orders change decision-making authority for school boards, and questions about resources and best practices for conducting meetings remotely. We're developing resources right now for boards, including information on the temporary changes to the open meeting law and a guide for organizing and holding remote meetings. Um, getting near the end here, at the federal level, we understand that the Senate passed a bill on Wednesday that the House is expected to vote on today and um, just generally understand that the bill includes funds for schools to buy technology to get remote learning off the ground, sanitize school buildings and pay for summer learning programs, and that there are also funds for child nutrition, including school meals. We're working to understand how this bill um, will affect Vermont's education community. I also wanted to let you know that I'm on weekly phone calls with the um, executive directors of all of the other state association, um, school boards associations across the country and um, learning what's happening in their states and how they're handling specific issues. Uh, I'd just like to close with um, probably the most important point is uh, that throughout this crisis, we believe it's critically important to prioritize resources to address the safety and well being of our most vulnerable students. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Questions for Sue? I know that we're going to be probably hearing at some point what's happening with the, the, the districts that have not yet passed their budgets and, and the struggles that they are facing. Um, yes, we are um, compiling that information. Okay. Any questions then for Sue, or shall we go on to Aaron? Aaron, thank you, thank you so much, Sue. We'll we'll stay in touch. <laughs> um, yeah, Aaron, hi. You, good morning, everyone. You have been working at the federal level <laughs> as well. Yeah. Yes. So so, and you also have the expertise in special ed. Mm -hmm. I know that our committee would be interested in knowing what we can and can't do, what levers we can pull and understand that there are very few. <laughs> so I did provide some written testimony and it feels worthy to just introduce uh, myself um, in the many roles that I'm sitting in right now. So I serve primarily as the Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion for the Essex Westford School District and then include special education within my roles and responsibilities, but is also um, very focused on issues of equity. So your conversations about that are very relevant to me. I also serve as the president of the Council of Administrators of Special Education at the national level and so um, have moved through presidency at the state level and um, have now taken on that role and so have been very involved in federal issues. I'm also a mom of a child who's home and trying to work and educate at the same time. So I serve lots of different roles in as it relates to all the conversations you all are having and grateful for your time today. Um, it feels most important to share with you the challenges about um, IDEA as it relates to the COVID-19 implementation of special education and want to first share with you, um, uh, this may sound obvious, but IDEA was not built for this situation. Most of our laws were not. And so we are running into a number of challenges as it relates to implementation. Um, at the federal level, we are working really hard to be family and student centered in our work uh, as we think about implementation of IDEA. And I would say that's true for Vermont and the work we're doing with the agency, as well as the work we're doing locally in the Essex Westford School District. There are equity issues that are showing up for sure. Um, the ability for a student with a significant disability, such as autism, to be um, engaged and um, inside of educational experiences that are uh, equitable to what other students experience when we're expected to educate from a physical distance is uh, really challenging. And what we're doing is doing our best and trying to figure out what's reasonable to expect. Parents are now partners in this work. And so um, it's 
it's nearly impossible to educate kids without the parent involvement at this point. That's, that's really a, a mainstay of what we're trying to work through and figure out. And parents come to that from very different places. Some people are working a lot right now um, because of their own roles and responsibilities um, as it relates to COVID-19 and, um, and making it really hard. And some parents are really available and want to engage and are able to spend lots of time I'm working with their children. I do want to uh, answer the question directly Representative Webb asked, which is what are our levers and what can we do and what can't we do? IDEA is a federal law. The uh, limitations on the Secretary of Education and the US Department of Education, is, those are pretty significant. Um, there's not a lot of leeway that OSEP, the Office of Special Education Programs has, or the Office of Civil Rights has, as it, as it relates to rules around special education. The Senate bill that passed um, and is being considered now by the House for stimulus includes a provision to allow the United States Department of Education to offer what flexibilities under IDEA are necessary. There are a couple of points that are important. It's really challenging right now to comply with timelines. Um, expecting families to engage in quality conversations about where their child will be in one year from now, which is a huge part of the role we play when we review an IEP and think about a new IEP and do an annual review. There are many families who are just not in a space to be having that conversation right now. And so I think it's important to recognize that and not pressure people into these spaces because IDEA comes in from above and says, you must review annually. But right now, without some flexibility, that is where we find ourselves. Our ability to evaluate students from afar is also very limited. And so that's another area of challenge. And I would say for me, one of the biggest challenges is trying to figure out what FAPE a free appropriate public education is inside of this scenario. And how is it that we document that? And Wait a minute, provide... Aaron, yes. you, we just had a little glitch in there. Maybe oh, sorry. I, with me. you said one of the biggest things and then. Uh, one of the biggest um, things right now is uh, um, trying to figure big, out how to deliver. I think you're saying, a, I just didn't hear what it was. Can you, okay. can you all hear me now? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Um, the, um, the free appropriate public education that is promised by IDEA at all times to students who have disabilities and are eligible under special education, um, figuring out how to deliver that in the context of COVID-19 when everyone is home has taken up a great deal of our time and energy trying to understand how is it that we document that? Should that or shouldn't that change the current IEP? Should it sit outside the IEP? Making sure that parental rights are intact and valued and families have their, the role that is their right to have in deciding what they looks like. It's the LEA's obligation to offer it, but it is our responsibility to work with families and consider lots of family input in the design. And so we're basically in this situation where we need to redesign in order to implement. We don't know what um, flexibility is going to come, if any, from um, the federal level. There are lots of attorneys across the country working on these issues and trying to figure out how we handle what we've got going on. Um, rewriting every single IEP in the country for COVID-19 circumstances would collapse the amount of time we have to serve students. The paperwork that's expected under IDEA is significant. And so we are working really hard to figure out how is it that we don't move into some kind of enormous paperwork event and stay focused on students and families, staying flexible to address the mental health needs and the well being of families is really important. And so, um, figuring out how to be legally compliant while also staying focused on what we need to stay focused on has been much of the conversation. Um, I am directly uh, engaged with OSEP as it relates to thinking about these issues and have been providing leadership for all of our states. We've had several meetings and we offered webinars um, thinking about the continuum of learning that's happening right now. It's different. All over the country. Some school districts have been shutting down around the country, articulating that they are not able to create equitable access. 
OSEP has spoken about this issue and said that is not what should happen. Um, and in so doing, the ability to create parity or true equity of educational access for one student versus another when our mode of instructional delivery has been um, contained so significantly by um, requiring distance between children and teachers is, is very challenging. Um, I, I also, in my testimony that I provided you in writing, spoke specifically to the equity issues that Secretary French talked about um, in reference to internet access. It is true that being able to talk with you like this in this environment of video chat is much more efficient and effective of a teaching modality than simply trying to consult with a family by phone to try to cause a parent to be a teacher. And where we only have access to phone and consultation or talking on the phone to the child to try to instruct, um, that's a really big challenge and is creating a significant equity issue. I would also say that for families who are experiencing food insecurity right now, that's another factor, um, as well as mental health issues, that's another factor. How much of academic work can or can't be done in any given circumstance I am deeply worried across this country and in Vermont and in my own space of local directorship about um, creating a further divide from an equity perspective in this work. That's not to say that I think we need to stop. I don't, we, we need to figure out how to do this, but I think we need to be very aware of the equity issues that are showing up and what students with disabilities can and cannot access under the circumstances and how we're going to handle that. Um, so I think I'll stop there. And again, feel free, there are other points within the written testimony that you're welcome to review and offer uh, you all an opportunity. Ask me questions. I'm happy to answer federal questions. I'm happy to answer uh, state level questions because I have been very involved in state level leadership around it as well, as well as the local implementation in the Essex Westford School District. Should that be helpful? Questions? Um, Kathleen. Yeah, um, thanks so much for, for being here. Obviously, um, one of the main themes of the day um, is equity, um, as Kate has said, and how we're going to try to deliver on that paramount priority at a time when um, those differences between kind of the haves and the have nots are only going to be heightened. Um, and I, I just wanted to make sure I understood something you said and then um, and then ask a, a quick question, um, which is that did I understand you correctly <laughs> that um, other districts not in Vermont, obviously, but elsewhere in the country, when faced with the challenge of trying to provide an equitable education under these circumstances are simply throwing in the towel and, calling it on the school year? Did I, did I misunderstand that? I uh, know you understood that correctly. There were some um, news articles about it. If you sort of Google this issue, you can find um, some circumstances around the country where uh, they made that decision. I am hearing concerns even in Vermont about um, the inequities that people feel are happening, particularly for students with disabilities who have uh, significant needs. And even with the creativity and all the ideas in the world feeling like there's just no way without my child being at school that they can access their education. And um, that's not fair. Uh, that's actually a violation of IDEA under yeah. the law. And so um, there were some, the, some um, districts that came to a place, at least initially, where they made a determination that they weren't offering anything to anyone because they couldn't do it within the confines of the uh, non-discrimination clauses and expectations, particularly under IDEA. Um, OSEP issued guidance um, last weekend about this issue and made it clear that that was uh, not an appropriate way to be thinking about this and that they did not 
want to see districts not offering anything because it couldn't be perfectly equitable under the law as it was written. Um, and so we have heard the US Department of Education speak on that issue and have been given clear direction. Um, but yes, you did hear me accurately that that is a storyline that's out there. Um, I don't personally have a connection to any of the directors in spaces that made that decision. Um, my counterparts across the country that I know and engage with have been moving um, more in line with the direction of Vermont. Um, but yeah, that did happen. Thanks, I, I thought I misunderstood. <laughs> so nope. thanks, yeah. Thanks for thanks for clarifying. I'm glad to hear we're taking a different approach. Glad yes. and not surprised yes. to hear that we've got a very different attitude here in Vermont. So thank you. Sure. Representative Conlon. And then Dylan after that. Representative Jean Batista after him. Uh, thanks. Uh, two questions. I guess one follows up on Kathleen's question, and, and that is, I mean, the reality of being able to have equity right now, given that, for example, some IEPs really can only be fulfilled with in-classroom instruction or at least one-to-one -one contact, and, and it's just simply not possible. I, I sort of understand this throwing in the towel attitude. Um, and I guess, so the question really is, what sort of guidance do you expect from the federal level to address the fact that equity just isn't going to be possible? Mm -hmm. There have been some conversations at the federal level about what this will mean as it relates to something called compensatory services. So compensatory service is a legal uh, fix to a circumstance where a school district does not deliver what was promised under special education. Um, I am struggling with that context myself as a director because the district is not denying anything. We have a crisis and a virus that's denying things. I, you know, right. if I could, I would. Um, <clears throat> so I have a little bit of a challenge with the federal perspective on, right now on um, compensatory education frameworks. However, they are being used as language at the federal level at this time to try to what I might describe as redress the equity issues after the fact. So there is some recognition at the federal level that some of this is by uh, the circumstances literally impossible. So where we have a goal for a student to engage with a peer or a group of peers across a long period of time and play together as part of a, an IEP goal in order to address social engagement, which is a, something we do a lot, um, you know, that's impossible. What does that mean upon return? Now that we've closed for the remainder of the school year, um, that question I think starts to also become part of the conversation. The Agency of Education in Vermont has delivered some direction around thinking about compensatory education upon return. So we not only have a lack of delivery because of COVID-19, as it relates to special education and IEPs, we also have the danger of regression that takes place for individuals with disabilities that's much more prominent for students with some, some students with disabilities than it is for their general education peers and what will happen if they cannot receive services in the ways that make progress for them over the term um, and they regress. I do think there's some federal money coming um, as it relates to these issues. And so financially, I'm, um, for lack of a better term, banking on some support from um, the federal government as it relates to financial investment. And there is almost only so much time in a day uh, <coughs> and children need a break and you can't serve them for 24 hours a day to redress what has taken place across this crisis. I do expect we'll hear more guidance about this. I do expect we'll see a request from the Secretary of Education at the federal level to Congress to consider these issues as it relates to the federal law that only Congress can change. Um, and so I don't think we have all the answers to those questions right now, but I certainly am well aware of all of them. 
um, and, and fairly limited as a local director and what I can do in this very moment in time to avoid the challenges and we'll need to be very creative about redressing the impact of this lack of service and educational program for some students um, over the term. Could, and if, just if you could very quickly just talk a little bit about what special educators in your district are doing day to day sure. right now. Yeah, and but, I know that we you will hear from a we will hear from someone this afternoon too. But go okay. ahead, please. Okay, I yeah, can you can just very, be very quick. Very quick. Um, so we are working with families to create something called distance learning plans for special education, and we're working to figure out what families can tolerate, what families feel they need, um, what we believe students are able to do, and thinking about the goals that students can meet during this time, and developing a document to the side of the IEP to be sure that we're documenting all of that and working with families around that, and then implementing those plans. So we are in active process of the development of plans, both from a maintenance perspective, as we went through this maintenance phase. So we have sort of two different sections of the plan. One is a maintenance phase. How are we maintaining the progress we've made so far on IEP goals? And then upon this move from education, educational continuity into learning continuity, at that right, right? Um, we will move into a conversation about what services and supports can we offer under the circumstance um, in order to make progress on IEP goals. And that will be the second phase of the plan, which will also be documented. We will be applying parental rights to all of those. So I, it's really important to me that parents know that school districts may be held accountable to the work that we're doing right now. Um, that is a huge part of special education and a really critical feature of this discussion. So families feel like they're at the table as much as they want to be right now. Um, so that's how we're addressing it. We will also be documenting um, assessment and progress to the best extent we can um, as we move move through. We are offering IEP meetings to any family who wants to do them. Um, we're not stopping the progress and trying to implement the law to the greatest extent possible. That's our legal and moral obligation to do. And so we're, we're really working hard to do that. Representative Jim Batista. Yeah, thank you for being here, Aaron, and for sharing your expertise, both regionally and nationally. It's super helpful, and we just really appreciate it. Um, I, I just had the calendar pulled up on my computer here, and my head is spinning. And, and I have a question, but just I want to lay this out because it's incredible. March 15th, I think it was, we got the uh, word that they were going to be closing schools through uh, April. Uh, that was to be implemented by Wednesday the 18th. Uh, last night was the 26th when uh, the news came down that we were going to be closing schools for the remainder of the year. Here we are on the 27th, and I think I heard the Secretary of Education say that the agency would be issuing guidance today, by which time uh, it looks like in about a week and a half on the 8th, districts need to have their plan for continuity of learning put forward for review by the agency and then implemented on Monday the 13th. That's a one month turnaround and I know we're in crisis, but I'm just wondering, do you, do you feel like the guidance is clear enough based on what you're seeing other states do? Um, I, I heard you say earlier, we need clear guidance and I'm just kind of holding on to that. I heard Sue say it. Um, do you think you're gonna be able to turn this around successfully in all corners of the state? Because I am worried about the equity piece and I know everyone's pulling in the same direction, but I, I just worry that the guidance isn't clear and so how do we ensure everyone's getting that rich education, recognizing that we're inventing it on the fly? Um, I will speak locally to say that I'm grateful for my level of experience and understanding of the law today for my own school district. And I have had to rest on that significantly in order to know what to do. Um, I worry about directors and um, leaders who do not have a lot of um, experience or a lot of background. Special education directors are hard to find these days. Um, there are not a lot of us out there. And so there are people in the work who have mentors and are brand new. And so I think um, the point being that guidance that's very clear is very important. <clears throat> I think the agency has been working hard to do that, but doing it too quickly does not recognize the changing landscape in which we sit. 
And I have seen some guidance come out that for me has not um, lined up with either what I'm seeing in nationally or what I believe to be right and, and best practice, where I've had to make some phone calls, have some conversations, there's been revision. And so I think our expectation of our own agency about getting it exactly right moment by moment is a really tall order. And yet I wish they could, but they're also not perfect and neither are we. And so there is a little bit of two steps forward, one step back, three steps forward, one step back, trying to figure out what is that guidance that's necessary. Um, I would not say that we have all the guidance we need, but there's more, I know there's more guidance coming. Um, I think that the issue of IEP amendments is an area that is of great concern. And I know the agency is working on guidance on that. We are very concerned about finance as you all are as well as I just heard in testimony earlier, particularly as it relates to special education and the funding formula. Um, I was very clear that I was hopeful that I would not see a lot of uh, micromanagement of what will and won't be reimbursed during this time. Um, and yet I worry that if we keep situating ourselves in laws written for not this situation, but other more normality, um, that we will end up doing things that do not recognize the kind of crisis that we are in. And so deciding something isn't reimbursable right now, that has potential to create some real problems. And so I know they're working on it. I know that uh, Visbit and the uh, school board association and the superintendents and the special ed directors are all providing feedback into the agency about this issue. Um, I, I think communication is really important. I was surprised not to know that schools were closing for the rest of the year, other than on the news. I mean. Dan's not here for me to say that to him, but that was an unexpected experience for me. I, I don't know, um, you know, I'm not in the agency to know exactly how challenging it is. Um, one of the things I'm working to do right now is really try to assume the best of everyone at the moment, at this moment in time, um, because it is really hard for everybody. Yes, we need guidance. Yes, it would be great if it was really upfront and really accurate. Can we expect that right now? I don't necessarily know the answer to that question, but guidance is critical as it relates to consistent practice across this state, and we do need the agency to provide that. So you have said, and I wasn't aware of this, that in the Senate bill that mm -hmm. is now over in the House in Congress yeah. does uh, give some authority to um, the Department of Education for flexibility around it around of the, the special ed uh, issues that you mentioned. It provides Is an that accurate? It provides an opportunity for the secretary within 19 to 30 days, or I don't know if the number 19 say, but within 30 days to request the kinds of flexibilities necessary um, under IDEA, ESSA, and other um, laws at the federal level given the crisis. So Congress has formally asked the department if, if this passes, they will have formally asked, and it doesn't change, <laughs> will have formally asked the department for their recommendation. Keep in mind that requires the recommendation to come forward, Congress to consider it, and then pass legislation across both chambers to make a change. So some of, and this is particularly true for IDEA, most of what we do under IDEA is in statute. Right. It is not regulation. The regulations mimic the statute almost in its entirety. Some additions. Uh, maintenance of effort, though, is one of the areas that under crisis the secretary can waive. So just so you all know, as you start to think about finance and special education, I would expect that we'll see some of that relief. Um, but as far as the rules, that's the process that it will have to go through. Um, and all of this changes moment by moment by moment. That's my current understanding. I have not checked the news this morning though, right? So uh, what gets pulled, what gets added, what language gets changed seems to be a very uh, moving target to be able to understand. And we're tracking it, trying to uh, use it to the greatest extent we can. Thank you. Um, let's see, Representative Austin. Let's see here. 
Oh, I can't hear you, Sarita. Okay. Uh, there you go. Okay. Hi. Hi, Erin. Hi there. Hi. I, I, I'm sorry. You may have answered this question. I know this is probably what you're experiencing is, is a national issue because this is a federal law. And I'm wondering if there's any conversation in, you know, at the federal level of how to not suspend rules, but look at the rules in terms of the delivery of special ed um, plans in the context of COVID-19. And so you're not spending a lot of energy trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, but trying to have a context where you can deliver services to children within this context? Um, we are absolutely trying to think carefully and support our members, which are all the special ed directors in the nation about how to do this creatively within the context of the law um, that's written right now. And so uh, that is something that we're actively doing, providing lots of examples, sharing resources across states. Um, Vermont's resources and the Essex Westford resources have gone uh, very out there pretty far um, because everyone's looking for examples all around the country. Kansas was actually one of the first um, states to close for the rest of the year and the director in Wichita uh, morphed the Essex Westford um, plan into the Kansas plan for him. So, you know, we are sharing and, and, and trying to address this in ways that are creative. I've said, by the way, I want to share, I've seen some amazing work be done with students with intensive special needs through video engagement. It's amazing um, what's happening out there. It is still very different, right, um, than being together all day with kids. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of creative ideas coming up. Um, again, parent engagement has been a critical part of that conversation um, and trying to be respectful about where families find themselves. Um, that's also been one of our messages. That's all within the current federal law. Whatever uh, relief we get from the federal law is likely to be more in line with it's okay to extend the annual IEP meeting date. We need to extend the 60 day timeline for an evaluation. We need to um, extend the three year old birthday expectation from part C to part B as it relates to transition. Uh, we need to be able to um, address IEPs in a way that doesn't cause us to try to rewrite every IEP across the nation and maybe have something on the side that can articulate in this moment of crisis what we're doing. So those are the kinds of relief that I, I expect will be coming up. Whether those happen or not, I don't know. And it's not going to stop us locally from doing the best we can for students and trying to comply. I mean, I'm trying actively to comply with annual review dates right now as a local director. Try to see if you can do it on Zoom. Try to see if you can do it by phone. Go ahead and see if you can have a conversation about these issues um, because that's what we're, you know, I am, I work to be very compliant. That's part of my, uh, the center of my being. I certainly don't wanna be outside the law ever. And so um, we're trying to do that as best we can. Uh, we'll see if that relief comes, but I think the creativity is about sharing ideas. I think Secretary French said that well, as it related to sharing ideas, giving ideas and um, talking about what's possible under the circumstances for all students, um, including students with disabilities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Erin. This was um, very, we're very lucky to have you in our backyard. Um, thank you. Really appreciate your expertise and knowledge and hope that you can share some of that with the special ed directors of our state as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for having me. And if there's anything I can do to help, don't hesitate to ask. May we will be bringing you back. <laughs> okay. You know, we think of where we were two weeks ago. What I was thinking about two weeks ago is, in the, is completely gone compared to where we are now. And who knows where we'll be in two weeks from now. Yes, for so, sure. Yeah. All right. I wish you all well. Stay healthy. And I'm sure I'll see some of you soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. So this afternoon, we'll be on again. At, is that 1.45, Avery? Is that right? Uh, yes, and I'll be on starting at 1.30, so feel free to log on a little bit early before we go live on YouTube. And get organized, yeah. That's great. So we will be hearing from the field. I know that there are some people will have some questions that some of the questions that, that 
went to uh, people this morning uh, may be best directed towards the superintendents and teachers um, who will be presenting to us to this afternoon. It's a, it's a long period of time. There's a lot that we're trying to fit in there. I think what I'll probably do is I I, I don't know about you, but I this is a, it's. This is a different way of meeting. And I think that there's kind of an hour and a half um, limit. <laughs> so what I'd, I'd like to consider and, and wondering if you, you, this would work for you for us to meet for an hour and a half and then take a, a five or 10 minute break and then finish up. If you can just nod yes or no. Sounds good. Okay, good. Um, okay, can I just add, add something? Yeah. Um, having watched, couple other meetings of other committees. I just want to compliment you and Avery. This um, was not clunky, it seemed to run very smoothly without any glitches. Thank you. You can turn everybody's mics on. We can just have a, a closing conversation. Um, I'm also, I'm going to go off YouTube um, starting yeah. now and, and just um, I'll let you know when we're officially off YouTube. I'm just going to check. So just. Okay.